Welcome back to the Lowdown on Physics. This is, ooh, what are we, screencast number four on the uh, series Interactions in Light and Matter, VCE Unit 4 Physics. Uh, today we'll be looking at the photoelectric effect and significance that has on the particle model of light. Okay, so at the end of last lesson we were talking about Maxwell and uh, his concept of the electromagnetic spectrum and came up with this idea that there was this whole family of waves and light was sort of this central character in, in this family. Now, time progressed a little bit and in 1888 we had Hertz who was using an, uh, a high voltage AC um, current to make sparks jump across a small air gap. I use my hands a lot. Um, now, each time he made the sparks jump, he got this, uh, this burst of radio waves, so uh, a frequency of about 10 to the 9 hertz. And this was the first bit of proof of uh, some other electromagnetic spectrum um, wave existing. So we effectively got experimental confirmation of Maxwell's theory. Now, what he went on to discover, I don't know what made him say, hey, I might try this, but he put UV light on the, uh, on the metal surface. And what happened was when the UV light was there, then the gap could be further. We could make the spark jump further. Now, this was a big contradiction to the wave model. So we couldn't actually predict or interpret this using the wave model. So it again raised big questions. So we've, we've found proof for the wave model, but then we've also <laughs> found that we've got an issue with the wave model. So it raised uh, massive questions yet again. Now, this uh, was known or became known as the photoelectric effect. Now the photoelectric effect is when electrons get ejected from the surface of the material, um, when you've got light with high enough energy or high enough frequency shining on it. So that, that, that's a key point there that you're going to need for your exam. And a number of marks are going to come up on questions related to this. So you just need to, to remember photoelectric effect. Photo, we're talking light. Electric, we're talking electrons. Light causing electrons to jump out. Now, usually they're emitted from the metal and we call them photoelectrons for that reason. Uh, light causing the electrons to jump off. Now, once we actually went on and we, I say we, but once they went on and started to investigate this a bit further, what they found was that the photoelectric effect did not always occur. There are a couple of things that were, it was dependent on. Firstly, it depended on the type of metal. So the type of metal that they used gave different results. Secondly, it depended on the frequency of light. So different frequencies of light would give a different amount of uh, electrons, a different amount of energy to the electrons that were ejected. And what they also found was this thing called the threshold frequency, basically the minimum frequency. If the light went below this frequency, then no photoelectrons were emitted. And this happened regardless of how intense the light was, so raising the intensity didn't change that, and how long they left the light shining on it. They could leave it on for days, weeks, whatever. It did not affect it. It would not emit any photoelectrons. Okay, so just a table. You don't need these values. You'd be given a value or given a graph that you could get this value from. But different metals have different threshold frequencies. So we see here we've got aluminium uh, threshold frequencies up in the UV range. Come down to sodium, threshold frequencies in the visible region, and cesium, it's down in the infrared, so any form of visible light would cause photoelectrons to be ejected from the metal. Now, Leonard's experiments, these are the ones that followed on from what Hertz had stumbled upon. Now, basically, it was 15 years since Hertz had sort of discovered this photoelectric effect. Hertz effectively ignored it, didn't go and investigate this part any further. Um, and Leonard came along and started to, yeah, sort of started to play around. So basically he got, uh, replaced the spark gap, put a couple of metal electrodes in a uh, vacuum chamber, and then investigated the different energies of the photoelectrons. 
when he shone light on it. He effectively used a fixed frequency and then investigated the photoelectrons. Um, basically, he'd apply to the, he'd set up a circuit and he applied a reverse potential. Basically, the higher the energy of the electrons, the higher the reverse potential before he could stop the electrons. So the photoelectrons are being emitted and he then would apply this reverse potential. It would push, the, push against the electrons that were being emitted and trying to flow through this circuit. So by increasing this potential from zero until he got a zero current, you could effectively work out what the energy was, or you know what the what the, what they call the stopping voltage, stoppage voltage, um, to make the photo current become zero. So fa basically, how much voltage did you have to apply to make a zero current? Effectively, that's how much voltage or how much energy was given to the electrons. So therefore, you you work it out as a you know kind of a, re a reverse process you undo what's been done and by looking at how much it took to undo it you know how much it had to start with hope that makes sense makes sense in my mind it might not come across quite as well but anyway you ask me in class if we if you want to re uh, re explained now what was Leonard able to conclude from these experiments so first first deduction was that photoelectrons will have a range of speeds so they get a maximum kinetic energy for the ones that, uh, that are released with the most energy all the way down to about a zero energy. But they get a range up to a particular maximum speed and they measured the uh, a half mv squared for the maximum kinetic energy given to one. Now that is equivalent to EV naught. So this is a, a new equation where that's the charge on electron times the voltage or the stopping voltage, V naught's the stopping voltage, which is for the maximum energy electron. As frequency increases, so did the maximum kinetic energy. Okay, so we're going to be probably questioned on on some of these and it will relate to Einstein's work, which we'll look into next screencast. But higher frequency it's a higher energy light, gives a higher maximum kinetic energy. And then the stoppage voltage depended only on frequency, not intensity. Intensity played no part. And that's a key thing there. And that, that's a particle property, not a wave property. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a few slides time. So. This is a typical photoelectric current versus voltage. You'll notice sort of this negative stoppage voltage here. So as we apply a negative voltage up to, in this case, probably about negative 0.7. So that would tell us that the maximum, the maximum kinetic energy of the electron would be 0.7 electron volts. Okay. So let's have a look. Maximum current depends on intensity and frequency of the light. Increase the intensity, you increase the current. Not the kinetic energy, but the current. Okay, so by increasing the frequency, uh, sorry, increasing the intensity, it just means there's more electrons released, not um, faster electrons. The current under the reverse voltage shows that they have a kinetic energy. So this is the kinetic energy that they require to overcome. And cutoff voltage. So this is down here. Maximum kinetic energy is what I was talking about just before. So again, this depends on the metal that you're using and the frequency. If you increase frequency, you'll increase the stopping voltage. So by increasing the frequency, you'll increase the kinetic energy, you're giving higher energy light, so you increase the kinetic energy, so you move the cutoff voltage to the left. So let's compare, you know, two graphs, what would happen if we make some of these changes. So we have some standard monochromatic, monochromatic meaning single wavelength, we've got a light source where the frequency is greater than the threshold frequency. Now, 
we have light with the same frequency but different intensity. What happens? Same frequency means same maximum kinetic energy, this part here, but we get, because of a higher frequency, a higher intensity, we get more electrons released, so we get a greater current. So intensity 2 is greater than intensity 1, therefore current that flows is much higher. So we're using I and I, intensity and current. Not very helpful, but anyway, so that's these eyes over here are related to the intensity of the light that we're shining. This is the amount of current that's flowing. Stoppage voltage is the same because the frequency is the same. Now, if we use the same intensity but different frequencies, we get the same amount of current but we have different stopping voltages. Okay, Higher frequency or higher energy means a larger stopping voltage. So therefore, it's got more energy, it takes more voltage to stop it. Not uncommon to see one of these graphs and you have to sketch the resultant for the change. So, you know, we're using higher frequency, what happens? Well, it needs more energy to stop it, so it's got a larger V naught. Or higher intensity, therefore more current, add more current. So that, that's not uncommon to see a, a two mark question say on that. Okay, example, you have a sample of potassium, we have green light with particular intensity, F0 found to lie in the yellow region, so that's F0 being the threshold frequency, is in the yellow region, we're in the green region, that's higher frequency, so definitely going to be photoelectrons produced. Let's have a look, what would happen, what would happen if you shone red light on the cathode? Okay, red is a lower intensity than yellow, therefore you would expect no photoelectrons to be released. It's below the threshold frequency. Now, how would the IV graph change if the intensity is doubled? Same V0, but we expect to double the current that's going to flow. What about if we used violet, but the same low intensity? Well, we'd expect the same current but we'd expect violet is a higher frequency, higher energy, therefore we'd expect a larger stopping voltage. Okay, so there's a typical exam type question. Okay, another example which will be fairly typical is we've got a particular light of a particular frequency falling on this metal. We're emitting photoelectrons, it has a stopping voltage of 2.25 volts. Work out what the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons is. So give your answer in joules and electron volts. Now, electron volts is this new unit that uh, I mentioned earlier, I probably haven't explained yet, um, <coughs> excuse me, is basically how many volts does it take to stop an electron? That's what an electron volt is, the amount of uh, volts it would stop to take that electron in terms of energy. So really, if it's 2.25 volts for an electron, it's got 2.25 electron volts of energy. So it's kind of a straightforward and sensible unit to use. And it's a really small unit, because if we convert the answer to joules, we need to multiply it by the charge on the electron, and we end up with an answer like 3.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So that's not a value that we want to be working in, such a small value. So the electron volt becomes a really useful value to, to use. So in light of the observations that were made, is light made of waves or do these observations not actually fit in with a wave model of light? So let's have a look. What are the problems with the wave model? Firstly, we, we, we've, come, we've, we've hit a stumbling point because the photoelectric effect is not sitting well with the wave model. If light was a wave, what we would expect to see is that energy would just continuously be supplied by the wave. So photoelectrons should always be admitted when light shines on the metallic surface. So as long as there's a wave on there, regardless of 
um, its frequency if we leave it on there long enough if we make it bright enough it should be giving uh, photoelectrons off so greater intensity because effectively we're saying a more energetic wave we should get greater kinetic energy again what did we see when there was greater intensity just more electrons not faster electrons and to get enough energy if you leave the light on there it should build up that energy over time or increase the intensity you then should provide enough energy for the electrons to escape but those those observations were not what we saw and guys we need to know this stuff you need to know how this how, how the photoelectric effect causes a problem with the wave model and you need to know how it helps with uh, explaining that it must be a particle as well so what I've given you are problems with the wave model you'll need to be able to apply this to a, an explain question you, you know undoubtedly that you're going to get one of those in your exam okay so what did we observe then only when you exceeded the threshold frequency did you emit photoelectrons if the light source was more intense you got more photoelectrons but they had the same amount of energy and provided the incident light was above the threshold frequency they were effectively emitted instantaneously like we you know we're talking 10 to the negative 9 of a second or a, million, uh, a billionth of a second so you know that that's it that's instantaneous as soon as the lights on they are emitted they are ejected so you know it, it wasn't a case of building up over time so what can we conclude then you know ultimately the only thing we can conclude is that lights wave behaving as waves in in some some scenarios and not waves in other scenarios in the next uh, screencast we'll actually have a look at what Einstein came along and said and came and came up with a theory to help explain these observations in terms of uh, light behaving like particles so till then happy studying